Alright, for today's Critical Thought, we're going to be discussing one of the holy grails of game design, and that is the immersive sim genre. When we talk about immersive sims, this is considered to be one of the hot, critically highest rated genres and one of the hardest to design around. Now, the term immersive sims was originally coined by Warren Spector back during his Looking Glass Studios days, and of course he is the man behind one of the most famous games, Deus Ex. But from a quote that he said about the idea behind immersive sims, this is what he said, You are there. Nothing stands between you and belief that you're in an alternate world. And that's a good basic concept of an immersive sim. In terms of its structure, this is where the idea of world building, gameplay, and the actual story or situation all coalesce into one unique experience. As the quote from Warren Spector illustrated, this isn't about just putting the player into a situation, have a bunch of gamey elements there. What this does is that every aspect of the game from the choices you have available, where you can go, what you can do, and even how you grow or improve, are all represented in-game. Basically, it's this idea of building up a set of rules and tool sets, or rules and functionality, that the player can use and exploit at their leisure. Now, a major part of any immersive sim because of that extension, or to extend from that, is the idea behind player choice. Now, this isn't player choice in terms of storytelling, as in, do you let somebody live or die? Do you get the good or bad ending? Instead, it's about how you approach a situation and the game allowing you to do that. So, let's here's a brief example. Let's say we are playing a game where I need to get from one room to, an, to another area past a bunch of enemies. So, the first time I play, I am spec for mobility. I have double jumping, I can maybe even wall jump or do enhanced climbing. So what I'm going to do is simply use the environment around me to scale it and avoid all the enemies on the ground floor, probably go through a few vents and get through the whole area completely unscathed. So let's reload it, and this time let's say I have black hole trap magic that I can sit on the ground, enemy walks into it, they get pulled in, and they die. So this time I'm going to stay at the ground level, but I'm going to be a little bit more sneakier. I'm going to hide behind corners, hide underneath objects, wait for enemies to get close, set my trap, kill them, and slowly but surely I'll make it through this area, and once again I'll be completely unscathed. Option 3, this time I am a heavy weapon soldier. I have, you know, super durable armor, a fully upgraded assault rifle grenade launcher combo, stuff like that. And this time I'm just going to go full uh, lock and load in the room and kill everybody and get to the end. It will probably be the quickest of the three. Now, the important point is that those three choices that I just gave to you, all three are completely feasible within the game space, neither of them are going to be actively rewarded or punished by the player, and I am free to choose exactly how I want to play this game. Now, another aspect behind Immersive Sims, and we'll talk about this and we'll get to some game footage, is that they rarely feature abstracted progression, in the sense of like experience points, finding upgraded weapons, uh, having enemies with levels, stuff like that. And the reason is that there's no real uh, in-game representation of that. Why should one soldier be more durable because he's magically level 5? But what these games do is that they focus more on limited but very powerful progression. And give me one second. Alright, sorry about that, the phone was ringing, but back to the idea behind limited progression. What immersive sims do is that instead of giving the player massive skill trees and all kinds of points to fiddle around, they go for limited choices that have massive repercussions in terms of your actions in-game. It's still considered abstracted progression as you are, you know, unlocking the ability to run faster or jump higher. 
But what this does is that it allows you to create a build and then have those choices immediately impact what you're able to do in the game. And for instance, in a game like Prey, when I get the upgrade that improves my agility, I don't just move a little bit faster. I'm now fast enough to be able to dodge around enemy attacks. When I get the full one, I can just literally sprint through the entire area and avoid most enemies. When I get a strength upgrade, it not only makes my weapons do more damage or my melee, but now I can pick objects up and move them around. I can go to areas where I couldn't go otherwise. And what, in a nutshell, immersive sim design does is that it creates a number of verbs for the player to make use of, and they all can work within the game space. And again, this is when we talk about immersion gameplay. But before we move on to that topic, let's load up some game footage of probably the current best example, or most recent, of an immersive sim. So here we have footage of Prey 2016 by Arcane Studios, and Arcane is definitely the masters at this moment in terms of immersive sims with their games, such as Dishonored, which I really need to get back to playing. But Prey, like we said in the last part, is definitely one of the best examples of what immersive sims mean, or the design behind them today. So, with Prey, you once again are given a lot of different abilities and ways of moving forward. The level design of Prey, and this is a major part of, immer of all immersive sims, is that the levels are smaller, but denser meaning that you're not going to be running into a level that's anywhere near the size of something like Call of Duty or Doom 2016. Instead, the areas are just packed with multiple areas or multiple places to explore, multiple options to get around, and it's just about giving the player a very wide berth in terms of what to do. Now, with Prey, another aspect of this are the weapons, and you can see a few of them on that list right there. In Prey, what they did was, instead of giving the player dozens upon dozens of weapons, they instead focused more on the story side. Talos IV is a science station. They're not military. So instead of needing like 27 different kinds of pistols and 15 assault rifles, it instead is just about a few set options, but then giving those options multiple functions or utilities. That uh, little flexi foam bolt that I just picked up there, that is for a little nerf gun that you would think, what's the big deal with that? Well, you can use it as set to trip traps, open doors from afar, and so on and so forth. But each weapon in the game usually has a different purpose or additional one. Probably the only exceptions would be the shotgun and the wrench. Which now that I think about it, a lot of immersive sims, especially from Arcane and the previous ones, really like the use of wrenches. Especially in Bioshock. I don't know, maybe these developers have been bought off by Big Wrench. But here you can see the Neuromod system, or, again, the skill trees in Prey. Now as you can see, as I'm looking through this trying to decide what I want to do, there's not a ton of options in this game. Nowhere near what we see in most RPGs. But each one really pushes you down a specific route. And the game, once again, is designed to accommodate that. When I get the ability to hack turrets, for instance, I can now use that in my overall objectives. And now maybe I can set traps for mimics or lure them into those areas. If I don't get that option, then I can't do that, but I can go do something else. And the variety of approaches is just such a key part of immersive sims. Now, as I said before we got to this section, it's very important to point out this. Immersive sims are probably the best examples of emergent game design, but not every game that has emergent gameplay is an example of an immersive sim.
And I know that can get a little bit confusing. But again, the key aspects of an immersive sim and what sets it apart from other games is that it's built on a variety of choices that are all represented and make sense within the game space. And the player is able or is they're free to pick and choose what they want without being punished or rewarded explicitly for doing something. And that can be very confusing. One of the things that we've seen for a, a lot of RPGs and open world style games is that they use just a ubiquitous experience for everything. Kill 10 guards, you get experience. Climb up a tower, you get experience. And then those points are just tied to something else. And again, the points don't really have an in-game reason for existing. But with a game like Prey or Bioshock or System Shock and stuff like that, the upgrades or the ex how you upgrade your character is done through an in-game resource. In Bioshock, it was Adam. In Prey, it's the Neuromods or... I forget the exact name of the stuff that we inject ourselves with. I think it is just called newer mods. But newer mods are not rewarded by completing tasks or by fighting enemies. They are found or crafted in the environment. And then this resource is the only way that you will have actual progression when you're playing through Prey. So while in one hand that does sound very limiting as everything that you're doing will not always reward you, but it makes the choices more powerful. Because I know when I expand or I consume, let's say, four newer mods for increased damage, that that's going to do a lot for me. And it also means that I am not being punished because I am playing the game in a way that developers didn't want. Because in a lot of games that make use of experience, they basically force you to do all the tasks no matter how mundane or even how much outside of your general playstyle because you need those experience points. In Prey, if I just want to sneak around and explore, I can do that and I can still level myself up by finding newer mods. If I want to go completely psychic commando crazy with all my powers, I can do that as well. But neither way is being explicitly rewarded or punished. And it's more about you finding your way through the game and then using that rather than the game telling you, oh, you didn't choose shotgun mastery for this boss fight? Well, now you're in trouble. You should have done that previously. And when your game is built on this immersive sim design, it, like I said at the beginning, this is where we get to some very unique and very master work game design, but it's not something that is easily done. There is a lot that goes into making a game like this, and far more than I can discuss with you right now. I've said this before, but if anyone has a uh, knows someone from Arcane, I would really love to talk to them about this kind of design, because like I said, this is basically like bread and butter stuff for me. One last point, and then we'll wrap it up for this video. One thing that we didn't see, I'm not sure we'll actually show in this footage, oops, someone just attacked me there, <laughs> was the gloop gun. This is an item that, again, corresponds to this is immersive sim mantra. It's a weapon that simply allows you to spray up oh, there some of that gloop that you saw right there. It lets you spray it on and it becomes frozen in the environment. Now, on the outside, it doesn't sound like it's going to be that great of a weapon. I mean, it just creates these little spots. Oh, I think I'm about to use it here. But what the developers do is say, yes, it creates those little spots, but you can climb on it. You can freeze enemies with it. You can use it to actually set up barricades. And it can become a very powerful item, especially for speedrunners, who can use it to circumvent a lot of the content. Because why fight in an area down below when I just literally create my own makeshift platforms and climb up? And again, these games are free to accommodate all those choices. And like I said, when it works, it just really works for the player. 
So, I know I didn't mention Thief, which I'm sure El Gore is about to comment on below, but besides the examples we've mentioned, are there any other great examples of immersive sims that you can think of? Let me know in the comments below, but thanks for watching today's Critical Thought. Be sure to check back for daily discussions on game design here, and on game wisdom, where some of the are in science of games. And we'll end with me just slowly but surely whacking up, oh, I decided just to blast that mimic in the end. But until next time, have a great night. Before we get to the credits, just a quick shout out to the supporters over on patreon.com slash gwbicer. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to check back for our regular streaming most nights at 9.30, 10 EST, and you'll find a schedule link down below. For a collection of my writings as well as audio casts on design, you'll find that at game-wisdom.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at GWBicer. If you're interested in hanging out and talking about game design topics, we have a Discord channel with the basic tier open to everybody, and that is linked down below as well. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, it is at patreon.com slash GWBicer. Your support can help to keep things going and growing, and you can earn rewards such as ad-free versions of our talks, votings for our specific Let's Plays and grab back streams, and more. But that's it for now. Thanks again for watching. I hope you come back for more great discussions on design here and on GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games.